invite you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me in the gospel according to Luke. We began in just a moment in the 16th chapter of the gospel according to Luke with the 19th verse. The subject is, is hell a real place? Is hell a real place? Some people think it only a figment of someone's imagination or some rant and raving of an angry preacher. But what does God's word have to say about it? In Luke chapter 19, beginning of chapter 16, beginning with verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark this expression in the 23rd verse. And in hell... He lift up his eyes, being in torment. I was about 19 years old when my pastor said, I want to help you get some Christian books. And I want you to travel with me to a pastor in this county who has called me and said he wants to get rid of some books in his study in his church library. We made the appointment to go. I got in his car. He prepared the car so we could load books in it. And when we arrived, the pastor met us and took us into his personal study and then into the church library. And he started pulling off the shelf in addition to books he'd already boxed up, certain books. And he said, I want every book that is about the subject of hell removed from my library and removed from our church library. I was sort of shocked, to say the least. I was naive enough to believe that all preachers believe the Bible, that every church crossed the T's and dotted the I's that we consider to be doctrinal truth in the word of God. My pastor was a strong Bible believer, and Brother Hagin said, this man is a man who doesn't believe what I believe about the Bible. As a matter of fact, he gave some names to him. He called him a modernist, a liberal, among other things, all ideally theological terms, nothing out of the ordinary that a Christian wouldn't say. But he wanted me to know that this man was not a man who believed in the inerrancy of scripture. And he believed that every word of the word of God is true and all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is, my pastor believed that. 
And I was shocked by a man who was a pastor and had been a pastor for many years who wanted to rid his church library and his own personal study from every book that had any mention of the place called hell. I've thought so many times about that, not only about the pastor, but about the people in that church and what they suffered at his hands. And I thought it doesn't make any difference what he believes. He doesn't change the truth. Is hell a real place? If it isn't, then we shouldn't have a church. We shouldn't try to have a Christian college. We shouldn't do many of the things that we do because the bottom line is we go into all the world to preach the gospel and train people to do that and place that emphasis in the life and ministry of our church because we believe that hell is a real place. There's confusion all the time about the things of God, especially about the subject of hell and the way of salvation from hell. As a matter of fact, the overwhelming emphasis given to hell when we hear about it is to man's hell, not to God's hell. The overwhelming emphasis is on the emphasis men place on hell. Pardon me for some of these expressions if they're offensive to you, but someone will say, I've been through hell. Or occasionally when they're having marital trouble, that woman has put me through hell. Sometimes people even say, my children have put me through hell. But they're never talking about the place the Bible describes as hell. Somehow in their mind, they found something they think that is relatively bad, terribly upsetting, and associated the trouble they've been through with whatever that might be. That's not the hell I'm talking about. And you and I need to know the difference between man's hell and God's hell. The word of God says there's a real hell from which to save the souls of men. And the greatest evidence that hell is real is in the cross of Calvary. When Jesus Christ became a man without ceasing to be God, he took on a body. So in that body, he lived a sinless life and gave himself a ransom to deliver us from our sin. He paid our sin debt. And the sins of all of us, as he tasted death for every man, were laid on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible tells us. They were laid on him. And the billows of God's wrath that were rightly to be given out to punish us were laid on him. If there were no hell, if there was no hell from which to save the souls of men, then all of that, pardon me, seems ridiculous. Why would the only perfect man who ever lived, the God-man, bleed and die, when he had no sin for which to die, no debt that he owed. Why would he die? And why die the death he died? The awful, humiliating death of the cross, not just as an ordinary criminal died, thousands of them on a Roman cross, but died for the sins of the whole world if in his death the payment was not paid to save us from such an awful place. I say to you, the greatest evidence that hell is real is in the cross on which the Lord Jesus Christ died. The Bible says, if you'll hold your place here and turn back with me just for a moment to the gospel according to Matthew, in the 25th chapter of Matthew, the word of God says in verse 41, when Jesus is speaking of judgment, he says, then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. And notice the last part of the verse 41 in Matthew chapter 25. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Prepared for the devil and his angels. 
There is a place beyond every awful thing we could use to describe it. A place beyond human imagination prepared by God himself for the devil and his angels. God intended for no man to go there. But those who reject Christ and do not know the Lord as their personal savior and allow Satan to be the king of their lives will spend forever and ever in hell with him. And Satan will not reign as some king of hell like some people in literature have described him to be reigning in hell. He shall be tormented day and night in this place called hell. Some lady held up a sign recently and the news captured it, put it on many newspapers across the country and said, I'm going to hell and I can't wait to get there. I don't know who's to blame for that. I really don't. Are her friends to blame because they've told her things that aren't true? Are religious people to blame because they've weakened every message about the subject of hell? Is the socialization of the human race to blame because they've made such a thing as hell calling it hell just to be the troubles of life. I can't help but believe if she really knew the description God makes of hell and the horror that hell holds, she wouldn't be saying she can't wait to get there. Those people need our prayers, but they need more than our prayers. They need everything we can possibly do to keep people out of hell. I want us to look at this story just for a moment and I want you to draw a sensible Bible conclusion to what I'm saying. I hope it'll change your life. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army said if he could send his recruits to hell just for minutes, that's all the training they would ever need. And perhaps it's true if we could have our minds and hearts captured by the reality that there is a hell. There is a hell, just as surely as there's a heaven. When the Lord Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. The same Lord Jesus who said that in John chapter 14 is the same Lord Jesus Christ who describes this account in Luke chapter 16. I want you to know that this is not a parable he's giving. In no other parable do you find personal names. No other parable. This is not a parable. This is an historical account. Hold your place here again in Luke chapter 16 and turn back with me to Luke chapter 12, if you would please. And the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 16, and he spake a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain rich man. Would you mark that? Rich man. And I challenge you to read through this gospel record. Keep reading till you find your way back to the 16th chapter of Luke, do it at your own leisure and find this mention of rich man. Even as we began the chapter in the 16th chapter of the gospel according to Luke, he said in verse one, and he said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man. The conversation is about rich man, rich man, rich man. But here, in the 19th verse, he says there was a certain rich man and evidently he's telling the story of one of these rich men that he personally knew. As a matter of fact, every detail of this account is familiar to the Lord Jesus Christ. The character Lazarus found in this story 
is an historical character, a real person that Jesus Christ was acquainted with. And so he opens up the hearts of his listeners by telling them this historical account of a man who died and went to heaven and another man who died and went to hell. We see obviously that there's value, there's value in what he said because he pulls the curtain. He lets us look behind the curtain. He allows us to see beyond death what we cannot see. He removes the veil for a moment and he allows us to look inside and see what's beyond the veil and then to come back to where we are at this moment and warn people and teach people and tell people what's beyond that veil. And he gives a story like this. He talks about two men who lived. One, the Bible says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. You can only imagine what this man had at his fingertips. The finest of clothes, the finest of places to live, servants, plenty. Anything he thought of that he wanted, he could get. And evidently he would have been annoyed by this beggar, this other man who had a life totally different. The word of God says a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. The rich man knew about this beggar. He was an awful sight. I think not much of his body was clothed. And when you looked at him, you could see these awful sores on his body. The worst kind of thing to stare at. No doubt much emaciated in body and covered in sores and to beat it all, dogs, just dogs who roam the streets gnawing around on this man, licking his sores. The most disgusting thing imaginable to look at. And that's the way these two men lived. And they picture for us two types on the social level that we, we imagine exist, the very wealthy, the very poor. But then he takes us to two deaths. Look at it, please. And the Bible says that the beggar was desiring to be fed with the rich crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, but more of the dogs came and licked his sores. And the first of these to die is the beggar, the Bible says. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. One moment, the dogs are licking on his sores at the gate of this wealthy man. People are watching all this take place. He's begging for bread and crumbs. And then they see that the man is no longer moving. His body is still lying there, but he's no longer in it. He's dead. And the Lord says, what you don't see is when he died, the angels came and carried him into the presence of God. They came for him. This is something you can't witness, but Christ tells his hearers, but this is what happens. And no doubt, as I said in historical account, so he say, this is what happened to the beggar who was lying at the gate, covered in sores and begging for bread. He died. Perhaps they took his body because it was really worth nothing to anyone and just cast it a ditch somewhere. I don't know. Maybe the dogs, God forbid, but maybe the dogs just gnawed on him until they got every part of his flesh that they desired. 
he's gone. But be for sure of this. He was a believer and he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. But now there's another death and the word of God says, and it came to pass, verse 22, that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom and this line is given, and the rich man also died. And God says of him, nothing about angels carrying him, but that he was buried. Now just use your imagination for a moment. What kind of man and what kind of funeral? No doubt the funeral people who did the greatest of funerals, everything you could imagine that would celebrate the man's life was done. His body was prepared properly, no doubt regally and royally and placed in the right kind of tomb. But God's word said he was buried. Now this much we can see. If you lived near him, you could see it. You could remember someone telling you that beggar that was there was dead. And by the way, the rich man, he also died. His funeral was something to behold. But the Lord says, I'm gonna show you what you can't see. And he said, and was buried. And the very next thing, and in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. He could actually see. He's dead, but he could see. And what he saw was a far off Lazarus, this, this beggar, this bum, this emaciated body, this man covered in sores, licked by dogs, doesn't look like that anymore. He's in Abraham's bosom, as the language of the Bible says. And the rich man is living, actually now, no longer life as we know it, just separation from God forever. But he views from hell, and he begins to speak, and the word says, and he cried, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus and may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. Now remember this is the description that Jesus is seeing and telling. Only God can see beyond that veil. We can't see beyond that veil but he's lifting the veil and seeing and telling us what is actually there. So the man begins to pray. The first thing he does wrong in hell, he prays to the wrong person. He views Abraham as a saint, as a, like some today, especially in Catholicism, would see the saints and pray to the saints. He thinks he's going to get through some way, somehow, through Abraham. But I want to show you something. I want you to write this verse down. God gives it to us in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2. The word of God says in verse five of First Timothy chapter two, for there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The only one who could ever hear and answer our prayers is the same one who bled and died for us and was buried and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father where he ever liveth to make intercession for us but he cries out nonetheless to Abraham. And the first thing he wants is water. He's asking for something himself, not a bucket of water, not to be washed in a river of water, not a cup of water, not a hand with water, but just the tip of someone's finger dipped in water with one drop of water. Jesus tells us in this real story. Beyond the veil of life into death without God, crying out for one drop of water. You 
Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you believe that hell is a real place? Or is it just part of our Christian conversation? Do you believe that hell is a real place or is it just part of what we think some people going through on earth when they're really having a hard time? If you and I believe it's a real place, Jesus says it's this kind of place. Torment, thirst, it cannot be quenched. But Abraham said, Son, remember what a horrible thing. Remember. He remembered every time he'd heard anything about God, anything about God's son. He remembered anything he ever heard about anyone who spoke with kindness and Christ-likeness toward him. He remembered parts of any song that was a Christian song that was ever sung in his presence and he was able to hear part of it. He remembered every opportunity in life, but no God, no Christ, no church, none of that. And he said, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted. Everything answered, every problem solved, every question answered. He is comforted and thou art tormented. That's the way it is beyond the veil. He goes on and beside all this, Between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. Not just a gulf, a great gulf fixed. Great, a space that cannot be reached beyond. A gulf, no way to get over it. It's fixed. It'll be this way forever. There's not one ray of hope after death for you to ever get to that place, ever. There's a great gulf fixed. Let me ask you again, do you believe that hell's a real place? Then there's a great gulf fixed between heaven and hell. Heaven's a place where people are comforted and here a place where people in hell are tormented. And there's a real flame there from which people desire to have one drop of water. He goes on telling us what he sees. Beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, he's asking again now, he asked for water for himself. He's seeing now, understanding, knowing he's there forever. But he remembers And he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. He's thinking about the days when he grew up as a boy, before he came to such wealth, before he had such prominence, before on this earth he held such power to have anything on earth he wanted. No doubt he's remembering every time he sinned against all of that opportunity. And he says something that's heartbreaking. Can he go to my father's house? Perhaps they were younger brothers, but at least brothers. I have five brethren. I'm thinking about them now. I wonder what they did together while he was alive. Where they went, how they enjoyed their social time and free time. 
I wonder if in any conversation ever the subject of death and what happens when one dies. Maybe they cherished their time together as children, playing. They grew up maybe as friends. I don't know. But there were five brethren. Imagine a home with all these boys. And now one of them has died and gone to hell. And he's saying, I don't want my brothers to come here. Where did you want your siblings to go when you were growing up? I remember when someone took the time and at God's prompting spoke to me about Jesus Christ. I think now that they knew I was growing up in a broken home and they had some sort of pity for me, not just about my soul, but my life. So one night after an evening choir practice at the church where I was attending, the music and youth director confronted me with the gospel and led me to Christ. He and his pastor led me to Christ, Don Brakewell and Dr. J. William Harbin. I always like to say their names. I always like to remember how I walked down the hallway from the choir practice room to the pastor's study and he was waiting. Evidently, they'd made some plan about it. And they got young Clarence Sexton as a near 14-year-old into the pastor's study. And they simply took the Bible and told me the gospel. It wasn't in a church service. It was after a church service. It wasn't in a youth meeting. It was a meeting they planned just with me. And they led me to Christ. I asked God to forgive my sin and by faith, I trusted the Lord Jesus as my Savior. It changed everything in my life. Everything. Everything I have and everything I have opportunity to do with my life comes because those people took interest in me. I would dare say I was the easiest person they ever led to the Lord. Think of that. I was the simplest conversion they ever had. I was the readiest person. But it was still the first time anyone ever explained to me how the Lord Jesus is my Savior. And did you know something? I am more moved by that now as I grow older than I ever was before. Because as I look back in retrospect at my life and what God's allowed me to do, I want to thank God again and again that someone dared to take the Bible and explain to me how to be saved. And for the first time I heard the gospel, God had prepared my heart. I wanted my sin forgiven. I wanted the purposeful life they talked about. I wanted Jesus Christ in me. And they told me how. And I prayed and asked God to forgive my sin and invited Christ in my life as my savior. And everything, everything has been different from that. Everything. I yielded my life to the Lord as a 17 year old. I didn't even think about anything else but just what I was gonna do. But God arrested me by his spirit as a 17 year old. Circumstantial things, of course, that's God's side in things. And he's working on his side with your life just like he worked on his side in my life. He's working in all our lives. There's no doubt about that. And I yielded my life to the Lord. That's because somebody led me to the Lord. Now what I want to tell you is from that moment, from that moment, I wanted my mother saved. My father was already gone. I wondered deeply about where my father was in heaven or hell. I wanted my brother saved. I wanted my sisters saved. And now this man in hell who can't do anything about it, not now, does not want his brothers to die like he died and come to this awful place of torment. And so he says, Look at it, please. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. 
Five, five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come to this place of torment. If he didn't do that in his life, he couldn't do that after his death. If you're gonna do anything to help your family, to encourage your children, to win your loved ones, you and I must do that now. There's no opportunity after death. Not for that. And the Bible says, and Abraham answered him. When he answered him, he said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. You know what he's saying? They have the word of God. They have the word of God. The word of God speaks of eternal life and the way of salvation. They have the word of God which is settled forever. They have the word of God, which is the inspired word of God, the breath of God. They have the Bible. But what if no one gets the Bible message to them? You and I sometimes are the worst at assuming that people know what we know, that they've heard what we've heard. We watch their behavior. Sometimes it appears so obviously Christ-denying and God neglecting. And we almost sneer at them for the way they live and behave. But they haven't heard what we've heard. They haven't been told what we've been told. They haven't been trained the way we've been trained. They haven't gotten a, in a church like this. He said to this man in hell, they have the word of God. That'll speak to all of us that we've got to get the word of God to people. Let me ask you again. Do you believe that hell is a real place? I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, but I'm asking the question. Do you believe that hell is a real place? Then why does the Bible lie on a shelf in your home? Why aren't we out with the Bible, the New Testament, gospel literature, telling people. You say, well, they won't hear. Wait a minute. Some will be just like me. They're just waiting for somebody to tell them. They will hear. If we had the boldness and compassion and lived in obedience to Christ to tell them, we have seen beyond the veil. We believe Jesus. God cannot lie. And he has told us what waits for them just beyond their last breath. And we can tell that. They have the word of God. And then he says, again, moved here with deep feelings, still in hell. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. I imagine that he's talking about now Lazarus is valuable. He had no value at all lying at his gate full of sores, desiring crumbs which fell from the rich man's table and the dogs licking him, devouring his body. He had no value then, but if now this wealthy man who, who realized Lazarus was God, he was with God and he was without God, He's thinking if Lazarus could just go back from the dead. And by the way, one Lazarus did come back from the dead. Remember that one? The brother of Mary and Martha? Remember that in Bethany? When Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, and he came forth, would you read the context of that? When Lazarus was raised from the dead, what did those people do when Lazarus was raised from the dead? They started making plans to how they could kill Jesus. A greater than Lazarus has risen from the dead. The Lord Jesus Christ who died was buried and rose from the dead. If he's the creator God and he says we create the awfulest of places for the devil and his angels. Remember when Christ met with Satan and called him out and defeated him. Remember the temptation there? Do you know that was a meeting of two former friends? 
Jesus knew Satan before he fell. And he knew those created beings, the mystery, I cannot explain it, that they followed Satan. So a hell was prepared, a place of torment, a place of suffering, a place that God deemed worthy enough to punish for all their evil deeds for the history of humanity. And now people go there. One has risen from the dead and he offers salvation full and free and forever. But somebody has to get the message to people that that salvation is available. I'm just asking one question in this message. Just one question, that's all. Just one question and we just need one answer and if you answer like I think you're answering then how does it change your life and what you do? Is hell a real place? And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, no word of God for them, neither will they be persuaded, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. In spite of it all, people are going to die and go to hell, some who continue to reject. But at the very least, you and I who know the truth and have seen beyond the veil and what God says need to warn them and tell them that hell is a real place that can only be escaped by knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. Let's pray together, maybe.